All right, so basically we're going to start just kind of by going through everything. So today we'll go through everything. I think everyone's in the room. And then hopefully when we do some cases in a couple of weeks, you won't like, you'll kind of have at least seen everything once. So it's going to be a more valuable teaching session, I think. Um, it is quite a long lecture. So we might have a break in the middle, depending on how we're tracking. Um, basically, this is just a crash course. We're just going to run through everything. And we've started at the syllabus. And this is, I've just kind of literally just snapped this out. Keep in mind that the syllabus was written in 2014. So um, a lot of these kind of studies have updated, they've been superseded by other things, and they may or may not be as examinable as, um, as they were previously, but we'll try and take that into account. Um, one thing that I did pull out from the syllabus is that trainees should be aware that nuclear medicine and PET CT is an examinable content and trainees should ensure that they obtain a broad range of scans and experiences. So today we're just going to try and run through everything as best we can, give you guys, you know, a first exposure, some high yield tips so that if you do get thrown something like this in your written or your vivas, you have seen it and you kind of are better equipped to tackle the case. For adult um, nuclear medicine, bone scans are most commonly what I hear is coming up in exams. I got a bone scan in my viva. Um, so we're spending a bit of time at the beginning, just making sure that you have the tools to tackle these cases. Um, also things that are in the syllabus is thyroids and parathyroids, ventilation and perfusion, scintigraphy, which is looking for your PEs, GI bleed scans, um, renals, which also is quite heavily coming up in paediatrics as well, um, liver imaging, which I think has kind of fallen into the background a little bit, especially since we're now using MRI a lot more and you know try, um, contrast such as Primavis for looking at our FNHs. Um, MIBG and octreotide is still in the syllabus, but essentially in adults, this has pretty much been superseded um, by gallium-68 dotatate, PET-CT, um, and that's pretty widely available around Australia now. Um, sentinel node mapping, that's looking at your breast melanomas, so we've got a couple of breast cases because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, infection imaging uh, in the syllabus is flagged as white cell scans and gallium-67. However, again, that's kind of getting superseded in a lot of centres with FDG-PET or if not superseded, at least um, a proportion of your infection imaging is going to PET instead of these two traces. Um, and then we're going to go through F FDG PET CT, but also we're going to look at gallium 68 PET, which is your PSMAs and your dotatates, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, just for PEDS, we're looking at bones, so fractures, non accidental injury or infections, the big ones, um, renal scintigraphy again, and then liver is really looking in your neonates to distinguish between biliary atresia and hepatitis. Um, other things which I can, which I thought would be worthwhile running through um, is neonatal thyroids, PET CT in childhood cancers, and then neuroblastoma in, um, imaging, which we'll go through briefly. Um, so just before kind of we launch into it, um, keep in mind about nuclear medicine. There are many many tests. There's lots of what we do, and that's why it's a two year fellowship to get across it at the end. Um, each kind of test will model one or more specific processes or functions, and that depends on the pharmaceutical and your tracer. So um, FDG PET is looking at metabolic activity. Um, receptor expressions is modeled by gallium PSMA. Um, you can use different tracers um, to look for blood flow specifically or indirectly um, while it's still in the vascular compartment. You'll see that in the case of bone scans coming up. Um, cellular function especially is especially important for bone scans, looking at osteoblasts, um, liver imaging, looking at the functions of hepatocytes or the reticular endothelial system, or alternatively tagging white blood cells in infection imaging. Um, Sesta maybe is a great one because we're looking at mitochondrial density, which I think is really neat. Um, and then you're looking, and then you can, once you get a tracer into a certain system, such as the biliary tree, the renal collecting system, then you can model that function as well, um, which is quite useful. Um, something really important to keep in mind, in a viva setting, if you can work out what test you're being presented with, then you can really well narrow down the differential for the possible case. So if you know that you're looking at, um, for example, let's take a biliary atresia study, which we'll have a look at shortly. Um, if you are presented a liver study in a, key, in a pediatric exam, I think that's the first thing you have to think, oh, am I looking at biliary atresia? Because if you can kind of work that out, rather than kind of deering in the headlights, you can you know, move through it and hopefully come up with a sensible differential that will move you on to the next case. Um, so that kind of leads straight into this. How do we approach a case? Think, what is the study? What's the isotope we're using? Am I looking at a single photon emission emitter, which is imaged on a gamma camera? And that's going to be your technetiums, your gallium-67s and your indium-111s. 
Indium-111 is less used in Australia, um, and that's just because it's really expensive to get. Um, the positron emission emitters that you might see on a PET camera, and they're mostly going to be your own, in an exam setting, it's going to be your oncology imaging. That's um, F-18 and um, gallium-68. Um, radio iodine is a few different isotopes. The main one that you'll see is iodine-131, which is used for treatment um, and some diagnostics. And then you can variably use iodine-123 or iodine-124 for your imaging. So think about, once you've thinked about your traces, think about your pharmaceuticals, um, DTPA is used for, and MAG-3 is used for kidneys. So if you know what trace you're using, you know what you're looking for. Um, oh. Yeah, you have the room to mute their mics, if that's okay. Sweet, thank you. Um, and if any point that my, um, that my um, audio drops out or if there's some technical issues, just flag it with me or for some reason you can't see the screen. Um, we'll keep going. So for each pharmaceutical, it'll model one or more physiological processes. As we said, recognize the scan, it'll give you the clue for the pathology. And that's just kind of good technique, um, exam technique when approaching nuclear medicine. So let's look at some words that we can use to describe the pictures. So planar imaging is anything 2D and th that'll usually be an anterior and posterior view um, because there's two camera, two heads on most cameras that acquire simultaneously. Um, but you can also get obliques in certain, um, in certain studies and just look out for those. Um, SPECT CT is, or SPECT is a 3D emission. So the plates will rotate around the patient and you'll get the 3D volume rendered. And in a lot of cases, this will be fused with CT, um, usually a low dose CT on our SPECT cameras. Um, and that's really useful for anatomical correlation and also attenuation correction. So you, it allows us to give you a little bit of better spatial resolution. Um, PET CT, I, I haven't se separated them out because in Australia and pretty much all around the world now, no camera is just a PET only camera. It has always got a CT on it. Um, and that just makes the images much, much better. It allows for good anatomical correlation um, and some places, stay, some places even use some um, iodinated contrast to assist as well. Um, and variably between the sites, you'll have oral contrast. So even though it's not as perfect as the diagnostic CTs you guys get in daily practice, it is pretty useful and a lot of um, information and increased specificity of the test can be gleaned from it. Um, when you're looking at nuclear medicine, intensity is a good general description to use. Um, if you're looking at general nuclear medicine, um, useful words to use are increased uptake or tracer accumulation. Um, photopenia is where you've got an absent tracer, um, so within an area of normally um, or abnormally increased uptake. So if you've got a lesion which has got a photopenic centre um, and it looks like you're imaging a cancer, a photopenic area could represent necrosis. Or alternatively, if you're looking for a liver lesion and the normal liver background isn't taken up and you've got a cold area, um, and that's kind of photopenic as well. Um, but yeah, cold is enough, another nice descriptor that you can use if it's not looking like it's got um, a, the expected amount of tracer. And that's a good descriptor when we come to thyroid imaging. Um, for PET, um, avidity is a good word to use if you've got an FDG scan. Um, hypermetabolic and hypometabolic is all, are also really nice descriptors for your, um, your FDG PET, but it's not useful for gallium-68. Um, and that's because... Um, FDG is a glucose analogue, so we're modelling metabolism for these. Um, we'll come in at the very end of the talk and we'll do a bit more about um, PET, but just keep in mind things like PSMA and dotatate, we're talking about receptor expression um, or a PSMA expression rather than, rather than metabolism per se. So just keep that um, little distinction in mind. Great. So we're going to start with brain scans because I think this is the highest yield part of um, the talk, um, aside from PET, in terms of what you might get um, presented within the vi in the Viva. So we'll go through a little bit of how it works, um, some kind of cases which are useful, and then we'll also um, talk about kind of how we would go about presenting a bone scan case in an ideal world. Um, so bone scans, the two most common tracers that you'll come across in Australia are, um, well, the tracer we use is, sorry, Technetium 99M and the pharmaceuticals are HDP or MDP. Um, they're diphosphonate analogues and they're incorporated into the, into the um, extracellular matrix. When you acquire a bone scan, we have early phases and delayed phases. The early phase is when the tracer is still within the vascular compartments or the capillary beds or the extracellular fluid. 
And what we're looking for is hyperemia. Is there increased blood flow to an area which might indicate um, a particular underlying pathology, including infections, recent fracture? Delayed phase imaging is when we image the patient when it's already been taken up into the mineralized bone and the intensity of the uptake is proportional to the osteoblastic activity. So how, how quickly are these osteoblasts lay, laying down the matrix and incorporating that diphosphonate into it? Um, it, it gives a nice qualita qualitative assessment of the amount of bone, bone turnover at a particular site, which can then be correlated with pathology. <clears throat> Some useful um, vocabulary. So when you're describing the early phase, think about increased blood flow. Um, think about increased vascularity is a nice descriptor, descriptor, sorry, or hyperemia in the region of. We'll see a case shortly that um, you'll see it in the pelvis. So you'll see there's um, hyperemia in the region of the right greater trochanter, for example. Um, throw your anatomy in to kind of localize your finding. On the delayed phase, um, talk about increased or abnormal tracer accumulation or increased or abnormal tracer uptake. Um, and if it's cold, photopenia in the region of. When you want to conclude, then you can use those descriptions that kind of, they're no longer describing what you see, but are correlating with the physiological process that you're modeling. So a nice way of um, concluding a bone scan is you can say there is increased osteoblastic activity in the right pelvis um, without significant hyperemia in of this patient who has known breast cancer. This is most in keeping with a metastasis, for example. Um, in some cases, you can consider whether there's focal uptake or diffuse uptake. Um, or solitary lesion versus a widespread lesion. Um, and they're very important when you're looking for um, super scans um, or metastases. Not so common in practice, but seemingly, seemingly common in exams. Um, another nice words to use, especially if the abnormality is very widespread, is innumerable or seen throughout. They're just nice words you can throw into your presentation so you sound really snick. Um, so let's look at a bone scan. So this is the early phase. We've got the flow over here and we've got the blood pool here. So you can see on the flow imaging um, that we've got the aorta. So we can just show, toggle that on and out. So you can see in the first few frames, which are um, about three seconds a piece, you can see it's in the aorta and then it goes out into the peripheral um, capillary beds and it's in that extracellular compartment. A blood pool image is, um, is acquired following the flow image, usually about two minutes after you start imaging it. And it's still while it's in that extracellular compartment in that vascular compartment, but you do start to see some of the excretion. Um, so this is a whole body blood pool. You can do them as regional or whole body, depending on what you're trying to examine and what the clinical question is. But it is normal to see uptake in the nose, in the mediastinum, kidneys with some excretion in the renal pelvis and then into the bladder. So this is all normal. Um, what you, once you start to see um, tracer accumulation on blood pool outside of these areas, then you have to start thinking about whether there could be an underlying pathology accounting for that. Um, this is a relatively normal um, delayed bone scan. The only, sorry, I'm just go back. The only abnormal thing is a little bit of uptake here in the left superior alveolar ridge, which may reflect an underlying dental pathology. Um, but this is all relatively normal. There's good symmetry. We can see the renal outlines. We've got tracer in the bladder um, and that's all nice and physiological and it's reasonably um, washed out of the soft tissues. Um, no areas of focal uptake um, and everything just looks, you know, nice and smooth and homogenous in those long bones. So we'll start with abnormal vascularity. Um, I think there are some cases that pop up in exams which um, the vascularity assessment is really important. Um, so things like acute fracture, acute infection or inflammation are going to cause increased regional vascularity. Um, things like osteomyelitis, and that includes bone infections such as osteomyelitis, septic arthritis or discitis, and then, or alternatively soft tissue infections such as cellulitis or abscess, which might actually be a cult on the delayed phase bone scan imaging. Um, other things to keep in mind that you might encounter are large vascular neoplasms, which cause abnormal vascularity. And um, an exam favourite, even though I've seen it only once in clinical practice, um, is complex regional pain syndrome or reflex sympathetic dystrophy, as it was formerly caused, called, um, which results in increased flow to a limb following trauma, injury or surgery um, in the absence of any um, kind of ongoing injury to the area. 
And um, since it is an exam favourite and since I found a case last week and I was very excited, um, I've included it <laughs> in the talk. So if you see it, you'll be all over it. Um, there's a whole bunch of um, diagnostic criteria for complex regional pain syndrome. So you kind of need that initiating noxious event, um, but the patient ends up with continuing pain, allodynia or hypoallergesia. Um, there'll be evidence of edema, skin changes, or abnormal blood flow, um, and you have excluded other, other conditions such as ongoing um, non-united fractures, occult fractures, other injuries, for, for example. Um, essentially, it's a clinical diagnosis, but you can get support on bone scan. What you do see is increased flow to the affected limb on um, the early flow and um, blood pool images, and then you get asymmetric increased periarticular uptake in the affected limb. Um, and as luck would have it, as I was preparing this talk, I had one. So um, this was a patient actually, it was a bit of an interesting presentation. Um, they're a spinal patient, I think it was a T5 um, paraplegia with um, increasing um, spasms. And they were looking for heterotopic ossification or occult fracture. Interestingly, when they fell, they knocked their foot um, and it, no diagnostic imaging had demonstrated any fracture. However, when we did the early phase imaging, we saw that there was increased blood flow to the left foot compared to the right, and that was confirmed on our blood pool imaging. So you can see this is the anterior and this is the posterior view, and there's increased um, blood pool in that left foot compared to the right. When we went on to delayed phase imaging, um, on the eye of faith, on the whole um, body picture, you can see that there is um, some increased periarticular uptake in that left foot compared to the right. Everything just seems a little hotter, um, a little more, um, a little more pronounced. And then when we did a spec CT of this region, this is a really nice volume render view. You can see that there's increased um, uptake. Um, this, the the colour scale is the same, so there's increased periarticular uptake in the left foot compared to the right, um, without for, um, without um, accumulating in any suspicious areas to suggest something like a stress fracture. Um, so this was um, called um, as complex, um, uh, as uh, sorry, as complex regional pain syndrome. Um, we haven't confirmed this diagnosis, but even if you do get a case like this, this is exactly what it looks like. Um, so let's move on to pathologies with increased osteoblastic activity. Um, and there's a whole bunch that you might be presented with. Um, and that's why clinical history is really going to be important with your viva presentation. So oncology, um, osteoblastic metastases, particularly prostate, breast, um, lung, um, you can throw in there as well, um, as well as some primary bone tumours such as osteosarcomas, um, particularly if you're presented with a paediatric case. Um, related to oncology, you might get um, thrown a paraneoplastic syndrome such as HPOA or hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. Um, then moving on, you can think about metabolic bone diseases as your second group. Um, and the most common things you will be thrown at in an exam setting is Paget disease, um, potentially multifocal, potentially transformed to osteosarcoma, just to add an extra level of complexity, um, or renal osteodystrophy. Um, the next, thing, next group is fractures, then infections, so osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, discitis, so your bone infections that you might um, see. Um, inflammation, um, probably less likely to come up in a viva setting, but just be aware that inflammatory conditions can also cause increased osteoblastic activity and in practice is going to be the most common diagnosis that you'll run across. Um, and then prosthetic complications, loosening infection of your hip, knee, shoulder replacements. Um, so this is a good starter case. Um, this is a three-phase bone scan. So automatically when you're presented with something like this, have a think. If you're presented with multiple, fa multiple phases, automatically you should be kind of more thinking, could this be fracture or infection? Because metastasis screens are often delayed. So we'll have a think of this. We're thinking it could be infection. We'll correlate with what we've said, what we've been told. Um, hypothetically, let's say that this is a 60-year-old male patient who's presented with low back pain. So tailor your search. Um, if you are presented with both, it is worthwhile just looking straight at the delay because you can see where the problem is straight away and then go back and look at your blood pool picture. So here we've, we've zoned in on the area of interest. Um, we've got increased uptake in the lower, in the lumbar spine, um, which appears to be centered on an intervertebral junction. However, um, we'd like to correlate with the spec CT. And on review of the early um, blood pool imaging, there is hyperemia in this region. And then we'll ask, hopefully get the spec CT up, but you might not. 
I think at this stage in my viva, I asked for a spec CT and they said, no, we don't have one. And they gave me a diagnostic. So you might very well have to conclude your bone scan at this point. And what is you can see here is there's like two lines. So you can say the pattern of uptake with hyperemia in the lumbar spine raises suspicion for um, a periarticular process, particularly discitis, if this patient demonstrated septic symptoms. It would be worthwhile at this stage correlating with a spec, slash, a spec CT if one was available. Alternatively, an MRI could be performed for further characterization. Um, so then here's one we prepared earlier, and so I've got both for you. Um, so the spec, the spec CT is actually beautiful in this case. You can see that there are erosions in the end plate um, of L4 and L5, and that is exactly where we've got our bone scan uptake correlating to our hyperemia as well. Um, this is a really good, straightforward case of um, discitis. Um, you could, if you wanted to take the case a little further, say um, I would further characterize with MRI um, or alternatively um, infection imaging if available. Um, because that way you can assess for things like complicating psoas abscess. Um, but I think given that we're presenting radiology cases, I suggest an MRI is the next reasonable step. Um, and here it is here. There's an, this is the post-con um, mid-sag demonstrating that there's um, enhancement of the end plates on either side of the disc with a little bit of high signal in there and thickening of the dura behind it. And this was a confirmed case of um, discitis. Um, this, Pediatric um, bone scans can come up as well. So this is like a companion case. Again, we've got early phase and blood pool imaging here on the screen. So we're thinking, could this be fracture? Could this be infection? And we can see on the flow that we're getting real intense hyperemia in the region of the left distal femoral metaphysis. And then it's on blood pool as well. So there's something going on here, there and there. So we go to our delayed phase imaging and we see that there's intense uptake um, in the metaphyseal region as well as asymmetric increased tracer accumulation in the left distal um, femoral um, physis. And then when we review on spec CT, there's certainly intense uptake correlating with increased osteoblastic activity. Um, in this location, in this age group and given the hypervascularity, this is most in keeping with osteomyelitis and that was the diagnosis in this case. If you were presented and you were present in, if you were presented with a case like this, it's worthwhile just casting your eye around the rest of the film as well, just to make sure that it's not multifocal as this can occur in a certain proportion of kids. Um, so moving back to adults, um, we've again got a um, early blood, pool, blood flow and blood pool imaging, and we can see that there's increased um, tracer accumulation of blood flow to the right midfoot. There's some arrows. So we're thinking, could this be infection? Could this be fracture? And then we see on our delayed phase imaging, we've got real linear uptake going along the length of the fourth metatarsal on the right foot. And then when we did a spec CT, it gives us our answer. It's, sorry, I thought I had an arrow, but I didn't. Um, so it's very focal in the distal head, um, sorry, in the distal shaft. And this um, is, was a stress fracture in this patient. Um, in the viva setting, you'd probably have, if you were getting a spec CT, you'd have a few slices just to really nicely showed the focality of it. Um, often stress fractures will demonstrate increased tracer uptake along the bone. Um, and it, I think in this case, you'd given a history of atraumatic foot pain. And if you were, you, you could say I would correlate, correlate um, or confirm the absence of infective symptoms. And in this absence, it would be most in keeping with a stress fracture. And that'd be a reasonable way to conclude it. Recommend, a C, recommend um, orthopedics referral or alternatively an MRI if there's, if there's uncertainty of the diagnosis. Great, so just running through like a bit of uh, like a scaffold for presenting a two or three phase bone scan. Um, I, those who have run cases with me will know that I like to start with um, repeating the, the clinical history and what I've been presented with back. Um, and that just gives me thinking time. So I'd say there, this is a three or two phase bone scan, whole body bone scan in a 60 year old patient who presents with lumbar back pain. Um, and by that point, I've scanned the pictures and I know where to go next. Um, it also helps you to remember the clinical history um, because that'll narrow down your search field and get your eye to the right spot and also narrow down your differential when you're ready to make it. Um, alternatively, infection, neoplasm, metabolic fracture. Um, 
So look at the delayed first, as we said, um, if you're presented with both at the same time, is, is the abnormality focal diffuse asymmetric? Um, and then correlate it with the anatomical location, including common lesions that occur in that location. Um, and then go back, look at the early phase imaging, tell the examiner whether there's hyperemia or no hyperemia in, the, um, in that region, because that'll help you to nail down the case. Um, so let's kind of, we'll present this one. It's, so we'll say that this is a two-phase bone scan with blood pool and delayed phase imaging um, in an adult patient. On a, if you can kind of go back and do the early phase imaging first, it's nicer, but you don't have to, but we'll, we'll do it in this case. So we'll say in early phase imaging, there is increased vascularity um, seen more prominently in the sacral region in the posterior view with an H-shaped configuration. Here it is here. Oh, sorry, apologies. Um, as well as a focally increased area of vascularity seen in the anterior view in the region of the left pubic bone. On delayed phase imaging, this correlates with increased tracer accumulation, again, in an H-shaped configuration in the region of the left sacra, more prominent in the right and left sacral ala, which is relatively symmetrical. There is further increased osteoblastic activity in the anterior left pubic bone and possibly also the right pubic bone. However, this is difficult to assess. I note the presence of a right hip replacement, which demonstrates physiological tracer accumulation. Um, in, this pattern of uptake and increased vascularity is most in keeping with a sacral insufficiency fracture with additional left pubic bone fracture. Um, I would recommend correlation with SPECT CT, alternatively diagnostic imaging if clinically appropriate. Actually, you could probably stop there. I think that's it. It was a sacral insufficiency fracture. I had a, in the case I was given in my viva, um, I said I wanted a spec CT. They didn't give one to me. They gave me a, a diagnostic CT. Um, and I said, I, and I just presented it. Well, this um, confirms the presence of a non display sacral insufficiency fracture. Um, I would discuss this with the treating team and recommend, you know, cons and for further management, something like that. Um, so that's one that one of the, I think, Melbourne examiners have in their kit. So just keep that one up your sleeve. Um, Non-accidental injury is something that is in the paediatric syllabus. Um, sorry, especially for nuclear medicine um, and it is fair game in a paediatric fiber, I believe. Um, so they're usually done as two phase. So we'll do a whole body blood pool and then whole body delayed planar imaging and then spec CT if available, um, which is available in my center. I work with kids at the moment. Um, so this is um, the blood pools on our chart and we'll come back to them. Oh no, we won't, I put ROs. So <laughs> symmetry, whenever you're looking at nuclear medicine, particularly bone scans is going to be your friend. So you can see in the left um, elbow, there's increased uptake compared to the right, which looks fairly cold. So then we'll also, then we'll go to our delayed imaging and you'll see that in the region of that left elbow, it is in, there's increased osteoblastic activity compared to the right hand side. So already with increased vascularity and increased delayed phase uptake, we are thinking that this could be an acute fracture. In addition, if we use our, our rule of symmetry again, we can see that there's increased asymmetric uptake in the right skull, now, which we now need to consider whether this could be an additional site of fracture, as well as the, the wrist as well. Um, so correlating with the plane film, you can see that there's a non-displaced fracture of the right skull corresponding to that area of uptake. And then um, looking at the um, X-ray, there was a not, there was a fracture through the proximal ulna in this child, which was um, correlating to that area of increased uptake. Um, a little bit more subtle in this child as well. There were some um, epiphyseal corner fractures of both radii, um, which were a little bit more subtle, which we picked up on the spec CT. But you wouldn't, in an exam setting, I don't think you would be expected to kind of pick something that subtle. Yeah, you can see it on the plain film though. You'd probably be expected to pick it on the radiology, but not the nuclear medicine. Okay, so moving on to metastases. Um, so basically you're looking for areas of heterogeneous increased um, tracer accumulation and focal areas of intense uptake. Um, this case is a bit like um, there are widespread metastases in this patient. 
And kind of the more that you look, the more you see. So I've got an arrow on the most focal lesion in the left anterior um, iliac crest, but you can see that there's um, there's left acetabular lesions, there's lesions in both um, adjacent both sacroiliac joints as well as throughout the spine. You'll also notice that there's heterogeneity of the ribs as well, reflecting um, metastases and with some more focality. Um, so you'd correlate whether this was a male or female patient, whether there was known history of malignancy, and you could recommend a spec CT to confirm, um, the, the, confirm the lesions. So looking at um, the super scan appearance, it is a bit of an exam favourite. It um, doesn't come up too much in clinical practice, but um, we're here to prepare you for vivas. So um, the two major causes of um, super scans is metastases or a metabolic. And I've just popped them side by side just so you can really see the difference. Metastases are going to affect the axial skeleton and the proximal appendicular skeleton, so all throughout the spine, skull, um, pelvis, um, and then the proximal long bones as well. Generally, it's heterogeneous, and if you look at the edge of where the confluent avidity is, you might see some discrete lesions, particularly see here in the um, femori and in the humeri. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's not nice and uniform. Then when you look at metabolic, it's going to involve the axial and the appendicular skeleton throughout. You get this increased, um, quite smooth, um, homogeneous uptake. It's relatively symmetrical. Um, the, you also see kind of, you know, uptake in the skull and the jaw. Um, the exception for a metabolic cause of a super scan is going to be multifocal Paget disease. And that's what this looks like. Um, interestingly, you don't see the renal uptake either. So just going back with super scans, you won't see a lot of soft tissue uptake. We'll go back just, and you won't, you don't see that outline. You don't see anything in the kidneys. You don't see a lot of excreted bladder activity. That's because it's, the skeleton is so osteoblastically active and so hot that everything's being sucked in there and you're not getting a lot of that physiological excretion of the tracer. So multifocal Paget's disease, um, the appearances on bone scan are actually relatively transferable. So um, between what you experience in your regular radiology and nuclear medicine. So if we just kind of concentrate on the femora, both are involved, but the left is more so. You can see that it's expanded, it's remodeled, it's, you know, it's really hot. It looks like it's probably getting a bit sclerotic and kind of, you know, working hard. So you can say that there's enlargement, bony remodeling um, and distorted architecture, something like that. Um, similar to the heavy pelvis, it's enlarged. Um, and then we're getting multiple vertebrae involved. Um, so this person's Paget's disease is, um, is working so hard that it's almost a super scan as well. Tiniest amount in the bladder, tiniest amount of soft tissue. Um, but that's another one, good differential to keep in mind as you're approaching vivas. So if we're presenting a delayed phase only bone scan, um, once again, we say this is a delayed phase only um, in a 60 year old patient who presents with you know, lower back pain again. Um, I think it's useful to confirm that it's a single phase and they're not just holding it in their back pocket just to see if you ask for it. Um, so you could throw in now, I confirm that this was performed as a single phase study and no blood flow or pool images were acquired. And then you'd launch into your description. So this image demonstrates um, a single focus of intensely increased, osteo um, increased tracer accumulation in the left hemi pelvis. Um, and then kind of go through tracer distribution elsewhere is physiological only. The oblique views do not reveal any additional abnormalities, um, something like that. Or alternatively, you can say there's multifocal increased tracer accumulation throughout the axial and proximal appendicular skeleton with, most cons with the most conspicuous lesion seen in the left hemi pelvis. Um, you know, they correlate a lot. Um, consider whether you're looking at a super scan, if they're throwing it, if you're in an exam setting, ask yourself, can you see the kidneys and what's the distribution of the changes and does it fit the pattern that you would expect for a metastatic or a metabolic super scan? Um, it is useful to look for associated soft tissue findings. And what I mean by that is I know that there are a couple of um, exam sets which contain um, bone scan abnormalities with complications. Um, a colleague of mine was given Paget disease of the pelvis, which had transformed to osteosarcoma, and there was increased, there was round um, increased tracer accumulation on the bone scan in the lungs. Um, so osteosarcoma can do that. Um, and then the, the, the case was to ask for the CT or the X-ray of the lungs, which um, demonstrated cannibal metastases. 
Um, other things is you might see um, increased tracer uptake in a breast lesion, for example. Um, so it might, that would give you the clue to this patient having breast cancer. Um, so that, you know, using that problem solving ability can be quite useful um, to get you through the case and come up with a reasonably fixed differential diagnosis at the end, which is going to make you sound really solid. Um, if you don't have spot views or oblique ribs and you think you're looking at, at a metastasis case, ask for them. They might have them and it might help. Um, and then I'd say, if available, I'd confirm with a spec CT, otherwise correlate with further cross-sectional imaging. Um, ask for a PET scan or a diagnostic CT if it's an oncology case, um, if you're unsure, um, MRI as you see fit, because use your clinical judgment to come up with the best possible plan. Um, there's a few, I've thrown in a few cases of abnormal uptake in soft tissues, because um, that can be quite, inter quite an interesting case and does come up. Um, so heterotopic ossification is something you'd consider in your bone scan patients. Um, so that's um, uptake in soft tissue, which is not in the bone. Um, and then cardiac amyloidosis, I think would be unusual to show you in a viva setting. Um, however, if you see something that looks like it's in the position of the heart, and that's something to think about. Um, and then soft tissue tumors. So that includes breast cancers and neuroblastomas. So here's a good case of breast cancer. Um, which was not treated. This was a very large fungating lesion and a delayed presentation, which was quite sad. Um, so there's very large um, area of increased, sorry, tracer accumulation in the right breast. And then you can see that you can almost see the soft tissues as well because of the induration and the accumulation. Um, so the, the uptake can be partly due to just increased vascularity and the tracer leaking out. So this is a large inflammatory lesion with impaired lymphatic drainage. So once the tracer probably in, um, entered the um, extracellular fluid and capillary beds, it just couldn't get its way out. So it just ended up staying there. Calcifying lesions, however, can um, take up tracer of their own accord. And here's a really good example of this. So this is a child um, who came, who was investigated with a bone scan for generalized bone pain and limp, and then found to have this scan. Um, so starting with the abnormal soft tissue uptake, this is a lesion in the um, right suprarenal area, um, which we'll revisit in a case later on, which we'll revisit their cross-sectional imaging later on. Um, but this was a case of neuroblastoma. And then the more you look at the skeleton, the more abnormal it appears. So we've got, incre we've got increased focal uptake, but on a background of generalized heterogeneity um, seen throughout um, the skeleton. So there's a focal lesion there, there's another there. Um, they, neuroblastoma likes the metaphyses, so asymmetrical metaphyses in a child like this, you'd be thinking about neuroblastoma. Um, then you look through the skull, there's more and more, I'm sorry, there's more and more, um, but this is pretty much diffuse metastases secondary to this lesion there. But this is, would be a good problem solving case to demonstrate your ability to pull it all together. Um, this is a case of heterotopic ossification. Um, you can see that there's increased tracer uptake. Um, often with the spinal patients, you don't see the skeleton as clearly. Um, I'm not, I think that could just be part of um, blood flow distribution and disuse. But in this case, you can see on aspect CT, there's um, increased calcification overlying the right greater trochanter, corresponding to intense radio tracer accumulation. Um, and this was a case of active heterotopic ossification, usually most active in the first six to 12 months um, post injury. Yeah. Okay, um, so we'll just move on to infection imaging now. Um, there's two, the two traditional ways of um, imaging infection have been technetium labeled white cells or gallium 67 citrate. Um, both of the studies are usually performed with a bone scan unless it's a, um, unless it's a very dedicated soft tissue infection, for example, um, trying to look at um, which liver cyst is infected in the case of polycystic liver disease. Um, if for something to be considered um, diagnostic of infection, the uptake should be um, more intense and more extensive on the white cell or the gallium scan compared to the bone scan. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, FDG PET is superseding this in many, in many centres, particularly for our younger patients and paediatric patients. The reason for that is um, it's a significantly lower radiation dose, particularly for gallium 67 citrate. Um, you don't have to handle blood products as you do with labeling the white cells. 
and it's quicker scan protocols. So with FTG, you inject, you wait 60 minutes, and then you scan for about 20 to 25 minutes. Whereas white cell scans will take a minimum of like two to three hours and gallium 68, um, gallium 67, you inject and then have to ideally image between 24 and 96 hours later. So it's, it's delayed. Um, this is an example of a bone scan. So we're starting on the bone scan <clears throat> as they're paired investigations. Once again, we see our blood flow and blood pool imaging. So we're thinking, could this be fractured? Could this be infection? Um, and we see that there's this area of increased hyperemia in, oh, sorry, that's tautology. There is hyperemia in the region of the right kind of buttock region. Sorry, left buttock region, remembering his posterior. Um, this was a spinal patient. They had a known, um, a known large ulcer and the question was, do they have osteomyelitis underlying it? Interestingly, there is some asymmetric increased uptake um, underlying the ulcer, you can just see there. Um, and that corresponds directly with that area of hyperemia. So it's suspicious, it could be osteomyelitis. And there it is there again on our spec CT, just demonstrating the asymmetry side to side. So the patient went on to a white blood cell scan and you can see that there's quite a large area of abnormal um, accumulation of radio-labeled white blood cells corresponding to that area of hyperemia, which would be in keeping with local infection. When we do the spec CT, we can see that the white cells are accumulating in the region of the defect um, and extending into the deep tissues here. When we correlate the, um, the left ischial tuberosity, we can see that there, in that area of focal bone scan uptake, there is increased intensity of white cell accumulation, which is more extensive. So it's more intense, it's more extensive, and this is in keeping with osteomyelitis. This is an example of gallium study, um, and this is quite a nice example. It shows you the three kind of phases of what you'd use for your interpretation. So this is your blood pool, whole body blood pool, whole body bone scan delayed, and this is your gallium image. So this patient presented with lumbar back pain, and we can see on the gallium scan, there's like this inverted U shape of abnormal increased tracer accumulation corresponding to some end plate increased uptake but interestingly, it was cold. It was um, not particularly um, remarkable on the blood pool, suggesting, which can occasionally be seen by um, in areas of abscess or, or acute infection, as um, the area is under pressure and you don't get increased vascularity. When you go to the um, spec CT um, at the same level, you can see that there's some um, some screws, there's some hardware in situ, and in that area of increased um, bone scan uptake, there is extent more intense and more extensive gallium uptake, which is extending downwards into where the psoas muscles are. Um, so this was infected hardware with um, osteomyelitis discitis with complicating pyogenic abscesses, which was di diagnosed on gallium 67. So we'll move on to neuroblastoma imaging. Um, it can theoretically come up in your pediatrics exam. Um, so it's a pediatric tumor and it accumulates something called MIBG, um, which is paired with iodine one, two, three um, for, an, for um, an imaging sense. Um, but it can also be um, form a theranostic pair with iodine one, three, one. Um, there is in some centers, including Westmead, um, that they're starting to use lutetium dotatate for treatment of um, neuroblastomas, which can be paired with gallium 68 dotatate as your imaging. So if you have some, an imaging tracer and a treatment tracer, which um, lutetium 177 is a beta emitter, so it um, delivers targeted short range radiotherapy. Um, then that's called a theranostic pair. You can image one, decide if it's going to be worthwhile treating, and then treat it to deliver your targeted therapy. Um, so some patients with neuroblastoma, as we saw with the case that we're about to revisit, they can, predict, they can um, incidentally um, have them detected on bone scan when they present with pain. So this is what a normal scan looks like. You see some uptake, uptake in the soft tissues, um, excreted salivary activity. You shouldn't see thyroid because they're given something called Lugol's iodine to suppress thyroid uptake um, just because you don't want to be delivering excess um, radiation to the um, to the, the developing thyroid. Um, liver activity, heart, spleen, um, and some excreted activity in the bladder is also normal. 
So this is the bone scan that we saw earlier, revisiting it, we see that there was um, increased focal activity in the right humerus, but this is on a background of a markedly abnormal scan with heterogeneous um, increased tracer accumulation seen throughout the skeleton in keeping with widespread metastatic disease. Um, and again, we're seeing that asymmetry in the um, metaphysis reflecting the infiltration by tumor. So this was their scan. You can see this mixed um, density mass in the right suprarenal lesion with areas of calcification in keeping with a neuroblastoma. This is the MIBG image. Um, it looks a little like it, you shouldn't actually be seeing the skeleton too much at all on MIBG. And this is just reflecting the widespread metastatic disease seen at baseline. This might have also like just trying to work out if the tumor was still in situ, but they may have very well removed it. Post-treatment, I oh know it wasn't, it was still there. So there's the tumour there. So this was actually post some therapy. Um, they went ahead um, and you know, started treating the child and you noticed that the, um, that the skeletal tracer has markedly decreased. There is still a focal area of increased uptake of the MIBG in the right femur. Um, but then we go on to their even further delayed imaging and now we're looking at a physiological scan. There's no uptake in the tumour bed and we're no longer seeing the skeleton. So this was a, a good response in this child to their therapy. Alrighty, so how are we doing for time? Okay, so... We're about kind of 40 minutes in. Would the room like a break or would you like to just keep going? Gosh, I can't actually see the chat box. Um, I've got kind of 29 people, so keep going or, or wait? Do we, need a, do we need a cup of tea? Keep going, keep, keep going, going, keep going. <laughs> okay, all right. Is the pace okay? We're all, we're kind of happy? Yep. Good, all right, sweet. Okay, let's keep going. So, thyroid. Um, the main thing we're going to be using for diagnostic imaging of our thyroid is technetium protectinate. Um, it's just um, pretty much how techie comes out of our generator. <laughs> um, so you don't have to pair it with anything. It's really easy to remember. Um, you're administered, it's, it's administered intravenously and then um, we image 20 minutes after. Um, it's taken up by the thyroid, but it's not organified like um, radioiodine is. It gives us a functional semi-quantitative assessment. It's really useful in dis um, distinguishing between diffuse thyroid disease versus a high-functioning nodule for a cause of hyperthyroidism, which is often the most common indication. Um, so you can see hyper-functioning nodules or hot nodules or hypo-functioning nodules, which are cold nodules, often incidentally detected. Um, the reason that they're important is they're more likely to be malignant um, and they need to be correlated with ultrasound plus or minus biopsy if appropriate. Um, so some medications can interfere with thyroid, um, with thyroid uptake, and that includes um, very isolated contrast, which needs to be withheld for about four weeks if you want a reasonable um, sensitive scan, as well as amiodarone, which has a lot of iodine in it. This is a normal study. Um, so you can see there's uniform homogeneous uptake throughout the thyroid. You might see a marker where the sternal notch is just to help you confirm location. Looks a bit like a butterfly. So this is a hyperfunctioning nodule. You'll see that there's markedly increased focal tracer accumulation correlating to the right lower pole of the thyroid with relative suppression of the background thyroid. And that's just because it's kind of pumping out stuff and the rest of the thyroid is suppressed. It's probably autonomous. Um, and the suppression from the rest of the thyroid is because the TSH um, is um, driving that. This is another case um, I saw from the Australian Family Physician. It's another hyperfunctioning nodule, this time in the left lower pole. Um, in this case, the thyroid is diffusely enlarged and there's heterogeneous um, tracer accumulation. Um, we can see there's a cold area at the lower pole of the right thyroid, as well as some more hot areas. Um, this is kind of, this is the appearance of what we see from multinodular goiter. Um, and given that there's a cold nodule, it'd be worthwhile correlating with ultrasound to determine whether or not this requires further biopsy or just monitoring. Here's another example of a multinodular goiter with a whole bunch of hot and cold nodules, as you can see by the arrows. Um, and this is a fairly typical appearance. In this thyroid case, you can see that there's um, a very hot thyroid. The nectar thyroid ratio is measured at 13.7, whereas normal is usually less than six. 
And what if we bring back this last one here, you can see that there's a bit of uptake in the um, to reflecting the outline of the patient. So we'll go back and see, sorry about that. There's very little background activity. Um, and this is because this thyroid is so hot and so hyper-functioning, as well as being enlarged. So um, this is a case, um, this is another companion case. So it's enlarged, it's very hot, there's no background activity. And if we look at our kind of our normal study as well, you can see that there's a bit of an outline in this patient. Whereas here, it's just so hot, it's suppressed everything behind it. So this is a case of Graves' disease, and Graves, sorry, Graves' disease is very hot, very hyperfunctioning, and it is a diffuse process that involves the entire gland. Um, this case here, you can barely see the thyroid at all. Um, there's a shadow of it, a little bit of a hint that there's some thyroid coming in here, but really most of the tracer remains in the soft tissues and hasn't been extracted. Um, this is a case of, and this patient would have presented with hypothyroidism as well. And this is a fairly classic appearance of transient, hypothy um, transient thyroiditis. So I'll go back there. So absent there. Um, here's our Graves case again. And I'm just trying to remember. Oh, yeah. So this is, yeah, Graves compared with, um, with thyroiditis. Um, so you can see that there's no gland seen there. Whereas, um, whereas it's very, very hot in Graves. And this is the distinct, distinction between the two. Neonatal hypothyroidism might come up in your paediatrics exam. Um, so there's a few different causes of neonatal hypothyroidism, which vary in severity. Um, you can divide them into three. So the gland may be absent, um, which is uncommon, but not unheard of. You may have a normally sighted but abnormally functioning gland, which can raise from transient hypothyroidism, which is the least um, severe condition, which can be treated with short-term thyroxine, um, to the abnormal trapping of radioiodine or an organification defect. Um, the other cause can be an ectopic gland and the most common being a lingual thyroid. So this is a normal study um, that was performed um, recently in a patient for, um, hypo, for a neonate with hypothyroidism. Um, there was only mildly elevated TSH and the T3 and T4 were normal in this case. So what you would expect to see is a tiny little butterfly normally sighted between um, the chin and the suprasternal notch, just in here. Um, and this was um, a called a normal study, and this was thought to be most likely due to transient hypothyroidism, which would be treated with um, some thyroxine in the meantime, and then um, monitoring. There it is there, tiny butterfly. This thyroid doesn't look like a butterfly. Um, it's round, it's amorphous. And then if you kind of correlate where the chin is, it's just below the chin. It can be quite difficult to work out where in the babies these are, um, just because they're quite tiny, the necks are tiny, the shoulders are tiny, but the morphology of the uptake can be a clue. So this kind of amorphous um, uptake, which kind of looks like it's kind of a little bit more high than it should be, it's above the shoulder, it's well above the suprasternal notch. And this is the appearance of a lingual thyroid. In a viva setting, it'd be worthwhile correlating with the ultrasound findings to confirm that um, the abnormal location um, and then use the two investigations together to come up with your final differential diagnosis. Okay, there is that. Um, so this is an absent, this is where um, there was no thyroid was identified on the nuclear medicine scan. You would expect it in this location. You would expect a butterfly or alternatively a rounded area at the base of the tongue and was not identified in this child. So there's two possibilities for this. Um, it's that the thyroid is absent or the thyroid is present, but it is not functioning normally. Um, and that means that it's not trapping the, um, the thyroid, the the um the protectinate and therefore the th the iodine properly. So um, like we had actually had an ultrasound for this child and it demonstrated that the thyroid was um, in situ. So um, given the lack of protectinate um, or techy um, in this child, they were diagnosed with likely an abnormal um, abnormal trapping of radio of the um, iodine, accounting for their hypothyroidism. This case shows a very large thyroid in a neonate. So it's large, it's very hot. If you put this in an adult, you'd be talking about Graves' disease, but that's not really um, encountered in the neonates. 
So this was an organification defect. He had a big, hot, enlarged thyroid and the organification defect and therefore an ability to process and organify the iodine um, in the system was accounting for the neonatal hypothyroidism. So radioiodine um, is important for treatment of um, many conditions including um, hypo, hyperthyroidism as well as um, and thyrotoxicosis in the setting of Graves' disease and hyperfunctioning nodules, but also important in thyroid cancer patients, um, particularly those that have well-differentiated disease such as papillary or follicular thyroid cancer. Um, usually it's for treating um, intermediate to high risk disease. However, some centers use low dose radioiodine for a remnant ablation. So there can be ongoing monitoring of thyroglobulin to assess for recurrent disease. The reason we use iodine-131 for treatment is it um, predominantly emits um, beta radiation, but it's also a weak gamma emitter. And um, gamma allows it to image and beta allows for treatment. Um, usually um, you image one to two days post-administration to allow for a physiological excretion. And then the post-ablation imaging is really useful um, because it gives an assess, gives, shows us where the radioiodine went, so where there was residual thyroid tissue, but also allows us to assess for disease. Um, is there nodal disease in the neck, for example, or are there metastases that we were not expecting? Patients who are administered radioiodine for thyrotoxicosis do not need further imaging. Um, so this is a post-ablation scan in a patient um, who has previously had thyroidectomy. Um, the thyroid is a very sticky organ, so you expect to see a little bit in the thyroid bed, depending on your surgeon. And you may or may not see um, focally increased uptake corresponding to a thyroglossal duct remnant, which is a normal variant and quite commonly encountered. Um, however, in addition to the uptake in the neck in this patient, there were two abnormal sites of focal uptake, which were not physiological. Um, bowels physiological, stomach's physiological, nose is physiological. This is not. So there's sorry, I put some arrows, that's all physiological, but this lesion in the left humerus is not, and this lesion in the um, right iliac bone is not either, and this reflected bony metastases in this patient, unfortunately. Um, this is another post-ablation scan, um, which demonstrated metastatic disease. Um, this patient would have required a higher dose. Um, I believe this was a local, a case of local recurrence in the thyroid bed, which is why you get much more extensive uptake than you would expect, expect for regular post-thyroidectomy ablation, um, as well as disease in the lung here and multiple bony metastases, which you can see are producing lytic lesions on the corresponding low-dose CT. Um, you can use radioiodine-123, that's a purely imaging tracer. Um, you might remember that, that that's what we pair with our MIBG, um, but you can use it in some centres. Um, the issue with that in New South Wales at the moment is we cannot manufacture it locally, so we're having to get it from overseas, which is why um, iodine-131 is more commonly used in imaging at the moment, just because it's locally produced down at Lucas Heights. All right, so parathyroid scan. Since we're staying in the neck, um, parathyroid uses cestamibi, which localizes to mitochondria. Basically, as the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cells, the greater number of mitochondria you have, the more active um, the tissue is. So good things, um, so things that take up um, cestamibi include myocardium, which we'll come to when we look at myocardial perfusion imaging, parathyroid adenomas, which is really helpful, but also neoplastic lesions or other high-functioning thyroid nodules. So this is a nice case because it shows two pathologies. Um, so there's an area, there are two areas of increased uptake on the parathyroid um, cestamibi imaging, which we then put pair with a thyroid um, scan at the end to look for discordant and concordant uptake. So these two areas are seen on the delayed image while the rest of the thyroid has washed out. And then you'll notice that one's a little bit more intense and then one washes out on the thyroid imaging, whereas one is actually more intense. So the, the more intense pattern is more in keeping with a hyperfunctioning thyroid nodule, whereas increased intense uptake on the parathyroid imaging and then subsequent washout on the parath on the um the thyroid or sorry subsequent not uptake on the parathyroid on the thyroid imaging apologies um, is more in keeping with a parathyroid adenoma. In most of these cases we'll do a spec CT and we'll see that the area of um, focal but relatively decreased uptake on the right um, correlates to a thyroid nodule and then this more intense area of uptake is 
posterior to the um, left lobe of the thyroid, kind of similar, almost in the region of the tracheoesophageal groove, where you would expect a parathyroid adenoma to sit. Um, so things for picking up parathyroid adenomas, they'll be um, persistently increasing, persistently concentrating the cesta maybe on the two hour parathyroid delayed image, and then you won't see the intensity of uptake on the subsequently performed thyroid image. This is a very interesting case and it just demonstrates the point that not all that is taken up by Sestamebi is parathyroid or myocardium. Um, this patient was investigated for increased um, calcium and unfortunately it was a great pick by our um, tech, it was found to have multiple areas of increased Sestamebi uptake which were not in physiological. Um, so we ended up doing a whole body image because we were worried that she might have had bone lesions and she was found to have multiple multifocal areas of increased um, testimony accumulation. And this isn't a standard investigation, it was just because um, it was an unexpected finding. She went on to have, um, the, oh sorry, that was the SPEC CT of that region in the, um, in the proximal humerus. And then she went on to have um, an FDG PET CT as well as a dotatate PET CT. And she had a history of a resected pheochromocytoma. Um, which then came, demonstrated um, increased metabolic activity as well as dotatate expression. So that was metastatic pheo incidentally detected on a Sestamebi study. Um, so keeping with Sestamebi, we'll move on to myocardial perfusion imaging. Um, these are paired examinations which um, usually incorporate a rest and a stress um, component. The stress imaging can occur post-exercise, which is usually a treadmill test, or alternatively a pharmacological stress test performed with adenosine or bisantin. Um, I'm finding that they're much more common, especially since our demographic has changed as more patients are being streamlined to um, cardiac CT. Um, we're more, we find that inter the intermediate risk of coronary artery disease or patients with known or severe high-risk disease um, who may or may not be um, who may not be an ideal candidate for intervention often find their way to us. So this is a normal study. Um, you see um, stress and rest are paired next to each other and you're looking for differences between the two, something that is got decreased, um, decreased uptake focally on the stress image um, suggests that there could be an issue. But what you wanna see is a nice round donut that looks identical between the stressed and rest images. This is a patient um, who has a very large fixed defect in the inferior wall on the stress image, and it changes very little on the rest image. We look at the, conf we look at the um, other views and we're seeing that it's very little altered between the, um, the two acquisitions, stress and rest. So this is a, um, a, an area of, um, of myocardial infarction, there's no areas of reversible ischemia, and this patient is unlikely to benefit from any additional, um, any additional intervention. This patient, on the other hand, has an area of decreased myocardial perfusion on the stress image in the infralateral wall, um, and then it actually looks a little bit better on the resting image. You can see that there's a bit more purple, darker purple through there indicating that there's reversible ischemia. And that's what we're looking for. It's actually nicely demonstrated here to here. Sorry, apologies, I'll go back. Um, this is more purple through here. So this is an area of increased um, of myocardial reversibility, suggesting that there is reversible ischemia. We use something called polar maps. This is the same case. Um, and this, um, this gives us a little bit more of an objective assessment. So you can see on the rest image, the defect is smaller, it gets bigger. So they've probably got a small area of infarction with a moderate sized area of peri-infarct ischemia, which is then called as this cross-hatched area. So this patient would benefit from some intervention should they be clinically appropriate. Well, there you go, smart. <laughs> Okay, so VQ scans, um, contentious, <laughs> um, depending on where you work. There are some areas that have um, protocols in place on when who gets a VQ scan and who gets a CTPA. Um, if you are um, at North Shore, for example, any woman under the age of 40 is usually preferable to have um, a ventilation perfusion scan just because it lowers the breast dose. And also pregnant women are, um, it's better to kind of, a lot of places will go with a VQ scan over a CTPA, however local protocols vary. 
Um, you're given a small amount of technogas to breathe in, which is um, technician labelled um, like a smoke. It's like a, I think it's bound to a carbon dioxide or something similar. Um, and then you essentially breathe it in. It sticks in the in the alveoli, and then you have a 3D map of where the air is going. And we take a take an acquisition. Then you're given an injection of a small amount of technetium labelled MAA, which is an albumin analog, um, which then sticks in the small blood vessels. And then we get a map of where the blood goes. Line it up, look for any area where the air is going, but the blood is not going. And then um, if there is that kind of defect, then you say that this is um, most in keeping with a pulmonary embolism. Um, for our, our younger women and breastfeeding women, um, we tend to pick um, VQ scans over CTPA just because of the breast dose, um, as, which is um, C CT chest is higher than the VQ scan. The fetal dose for both, however, is less than one millisievert, which is really, really low. Um, and if you are reading some literature, especially from the States, um, which says that the fetal dose is higher, that's probably because they're using aerosolized DTPA, which is renally excreted. Australian technogas is not renally excreted, so it doesn't contribute to the fetal dose. Here's a normal study. Um, what you want to see is a uniform tracer accumulation throughout the lungs um, on both the ventilation and the perfusion. You don't see any wedge-shaped defects. It all looks really nice and smooth. You can always compare vent to perf, vent to perf, or perf to vent. Um, and just um, when you, if you are seeing a case like this, just orientate yourself to which acquisition is which. Um, a lot of centres now use SPEC CT, which has superseded um, planar imaging, but we are still seeing the same patterns. Nice and smooth vent, nice and smooth perf, no areas of wedge shape perfusion defects to suggest a PE. Um, so this is an abnormal study. You'll see um, that while the, um, the ventilation image looks fairly uniform, there are multiple wedge-shaped areas of decreased perfusion. It looks like somebody is like nibbled at the lungs. Um, and this area is predominantly um, mismatched, is a good term to use. There is a little bit of decreased vent, which can be seen, but it's essentially mismatched between the two. So if you are seeing areas of mismatch, particularly if they're multiple, um, large, um, segmental versus subsegmental, then this would be in keeping with acute with um, pulmonary embolism. There it is there. And same goes for um, spec CT. There's actually quite um, several quite large perfusion defects in this patient. Um, particularly this one in the right upper lobe. You can see that even though the vent is quite smooth and relatively preserved, there's a very large area of perfusion defect. I'm um, seeing the axial plane um, marked by the arrows, and this patient had multiple bilateral um, acute pulmonary emboli. Um, GI bleed studies, I don't want to spend too much time on because um, I just don't think you're going to be able to see, you're going to see them so much, but it is in the syllabus, so just so you know what we're looking at. We label red blood cells, um, and then we look for abnormal accumulation. This um, is what they will look like. You see um, anterior and posterior um, framed images that are required over um, an, half an hour to an hour, depending. Um, in this case, there was a concern for upper GI bleeding. And if you look on the initial images, you just see nice, um, nice vascularity, but an area of increasing tracer accumulation here in the right retroperitoneum, which changes. If we blow this up, this is three consecutive frames. You see it kind of looking more focal here, then becoming more linear and kind of spreading out and changing. And this is in keeping with an upper GI bleed um, localized to the duodenum, most likely from a duodenal ulcer. All right, so renal studies can come up in your adult or your pediatric survivors. Um, reasons we do them in native kidneys is looking for decreased function, obstruction, um, renovascular hypertension as well, but you probably wouldn't be examined on that. In transplant kidneys, we're looking for ATN, rejection, urine leak, or obstruction, particularly in the early postoperative, um, in the early postoperative phase. Things that we can model on our dynamic renal studies include perfusion extraction of the tracers, which can also give us an idea about differential renal function and symmetry, and excretion, which is how we look for obstruction.
Here's a relatively normal study. We look to see that the kidneys appear within the, um, the frame after or, in, um, or within a couple of seconds of the aorta. So we can see our aorta and we can see both kidneys symmetrically, which is normal. Then we see uptake of tracer, clearing of the blood pool, and we see them kind of take it up and then progressively clear over the course of the study. And that is a normal study. Um, here we've calculated differential function, 52% um, to the left and 48 to the right, and that's within normal limits. And also they've calculated um, some washout curves here. Um, usually you want to exceed that um, the T half or the washout of the kidneys is less than approximately kind of t um, 15 minutes is probably a good number. Okay, slit function 52 to 48. This is a child who's got a markedly abnormal study. Um, I think the, there was injected through the foot, so the bolus isn't so ideal. You can see it coming through here. But there's, you'll notice that you're seeing a right renal shadow, but a uh, right renal vascularity, but less on the left hand side. And then we go to correlate, you'll see that there's prompt extraction in that um, right hand kidney. Note that these are taken from the back, so they're flipped. So this is right, this is left. Um, so there's delayed extraction in the left kidney, and then you'll see that there's progressive accumulation of counts, which is then quite intense, even on a 1.5 hour delayed phase image. You'll also see that there's um, an outline of the renal pelvis um, in terms of looking at those counts. When we put some curves on it, um, the left kidney is up going, and this is abnormal, whereas the right kidney, it's a little bit delayed, but it's not too bad. Um, whereas all of the, the, um, the abnormalities going on that contralateral side. Even with differential function, you'll see that the split function is markedly decreased on that left, and it's almost like it's ballooning and um, over the course of the study. So this is a case of severe um, PUJ obstruction in a young child. You'll see that even on, when we calculate between the post void and the 1.5 hour delayed image, there's marked retention of counts. So I'll just go back. So it's just not draining at all. Um, this is a similar companion case. Um, this baby had bilateral hydroureter. Um, and the question was whether there was a, a VUJ obstruction. You can see again that there's um, decreased asymmetric vascularity to the right kidney and then some hold up um, and then hold up and progressive um, delayed excretion of the left kidney. But Conversely, we can see the dilated ureter as well in this case, reflecting that VUJ obstruction. Um, function again, um, the left kidney um, had greater, greater function than the right, um, suggesting that the, suggest, reflecting the pathology. The left kidney, even though it looked a little dilated, had a good washout time of six minutes. That's excellent, that's fine. Um, the curve on the, um, on the right-hand kidney was 22 minutes, um, probably fit, Oh, it's hard to say, it might even be an overcall, but it did not look like it was draining as effectively. This probably isn't as high grade as an obstruction as we saw with that PJ alternative, but however, it does look like there's at least moderate obstruction accounting for the abnormality and then residual counts. Um, this was an adult patient um, who was recently um, had a renal transplant. Um, you can see that we see the aorta and then within two frames we've got vascularity, that's normal. So normal um, flow to the kidney, you can see it just there, a little bean shape. However, what we do see is progressive accumulation and cortical retention of tracer on this MAG3 study progressively over the examination and very little excretion. Um, in a patient who's recently post renal transplant, this is most in keeping with acute tubular necrosis. Um, the difference between acute rejection and acute tubular necrosis is most evident on the vascularity. If there is um, acute rejection, there will be decreased vascularity to that transplant, which we saw on the early image was normal in this case. Um, again, we're seeing an upgoing renogram, suggesting that it's not really washing out and that's abnormal. Um, I'm cautious of time. I know I don't want to keep you guys and you're probably minds wandering, so we'll kind of keep motoring through. Um, for DMSA, um, we are, hang on, I'll just double check the chat window, keep going, okay, great. Um, so for renal parenchymal imaging, DMSA is really useful and the most common reason we see it is assessment of renal, potential known or suspected renal scarring in children, especially if they've had multiple UTIs 
or alternatively they've got um, other congenital issues which might relate to or predispose them to pyelonephritis or renal scarring. Um, the mechanism of uptake is a little bit un unclear as opposed to DMSA and, um, sorry, DTPA and MAG3, which are glomerular and tubular agents respectively. But they think it's partly due to some retention in the tubular cells. This is a normal study. You want to see nice outlines of the kidneys. We're not looking at the collecting system at all. This is only looking at cortex. So it's nice and round, it's nice and smooth. There's no bites taken out of it. And then when we look at our symmetrical function, again, we've got 51 to 48, which is nice and normal. And we do get some measurements. So this is a nice, nice normal study. On the other hand, this is an abnormal study. You can see in the left kidney in the interpolar region, there is an area of um, wedge-shaped decreased tracer accumulation, um, which would be consistent with a diagnosis of renal scarring. And then if you're presenting this case, you'd say, since I would consider whether there was a history of multiple UTIs or alternatively of a psychiatric um, reflux. If this hasn't been evaluated, you recommend a, um, an MCU study, and that might very well come up. Here is a really abnormal study. Um, the right kidney is very small. It is barely taking up any tracer at all and it has a heterogeneous outline. So this might be, you can't really tell the cause of this. It could be um, some kind of chronic cause. It could just be, sorry, congenital, hard to say. You correlate with the, that with the clinical history, but this is a very poorly functioning right kidney contributing only 11% to overall function. Um, just for fun, this is um, another thing that DMSA can be quite useful for, and that's demonstrating morphology. Um, this is a pelvic horseshoe kidney, which is fused in the middle, um, which you get a nice idea of what the, of the outline. And we can also say that it's still, you can still make comment that it's nice and homogenous. Um, there are no areas of, um, there are no areas to suggest renal cortical scarring in this case. Um, hepatobiliary imaging, less likely to come up, but um, just it is in the syllabus, so just to run through it quickly. Um, Hyder and Decider as um, hepatocyte agents, they're taken up by the hepatocytes, they're um, excreted into the biliary system and then drained by the biliary tree and concentrated by the gallbladder. Um, things we can assess on these studies are hepatocyte function, biliary excretion, um, patency of the biliary tree and the cystic duct, as well as gallbladder function, which can be called cholecystography. With our gallbladder patients, um, we will give them a fatty meal after one hour dynamic imaging once the gallbladder has filled to observe contraction and we can give a um, ejection fraction. Or alternatively, if the gallbladder is not filling, you can give morphine to contract the sphincter of Oddi and um, push the, the tracer into the gallbladder. Um, this is a nice normal study. You see it in the blood pool and then uniform tracer extraction by the liver, we see the gallbladder filling quite promptly and feeling really well. At this point, the patient would have been given a fatty meal, which is Ensure Plus, and then we're seeing the gallbladder get smaller and smaller over time. Um, our text will put a region of interest on that, and so we can calculate the fraction, and we see a graph. And this fraction, ejection fraction has come out at 75%. Um, with normal greater than 35, this was considered a normal study. This is not a normal study. Um, so this is something we don't see very much anymore, but occasionally comes up. Um, this patient had some right upper quadrant pain. Um, they were given the tracer. One thing you will notice was we're not seeing the gallbladder at all. Um, but we are seeing this kind of amorphous area here surrounding the gallbladder fossa. So when we blow it up, this is called a hot rim sign. And then we see photopenia in the expected location of the gallbladder just there. And this is what acute cholecystitis looks like. The hot rim is reflecting hyperemia in the gallbladder fossa and um, as the tracer is distributed there. This is a case um, of um, a calculus cholecystitis or chronic cholecystitis um, where you see um, reasonable um, extraction of tracer from the blood pool and in the liver is losing the counts. Um, it's being taken up by the um, by the gallbladder, but then when we give the fatty meal, that gallbladder is showing minimal contraction at all. Once we look at our curves, we can see that there's only 11% ejection fraction, which is well below that normal limit of 
One thing I will just take us back to the normal study is something that we want to be seeing is prompt passage into the um, into the small bowel, which we see a little bit here, but really after we give the ensure, we want to see it excreted into that small bowel really promptly, which is then reassuring that we've got a nice patent biliary tree. Um, something that your syllabus writer, oh sorry, we'll go to this biliary atresia um, case. This is a neonate. You see that there's uniform tracer uptake throughout the gall, um, throughout the um, the liver, but we once again we're not seeing a gallbladder at all. But more importantly, we're not seeing any um, any small bowel excretion whatsoever. And you can image these neonates out to 24 hours and you won't see any excretion into the small bowel um, if there's this case of biliary atresia. And that, is the, and that is the finding that you'd expect in the differential diagnosis of hepatitis where there would be some tracer in the small bowel. Um, this is biliary, I'm sorry, this is um, kidney excretion. So in the bladder, um, which is an accessory pathway to get rid of some of the extra counts. This child was confirmed as having biliary atresia, so there was a cord sign um, and there was no um, common duct able to be visualised on ultrasound and no normal gallbladder was demonstrated in the gallbladder fossa. Um, liver and spleen imaging with technetium sulfur colloid, it's a particle um, taken up by the reticular endothelial system, so it can therefore be used for splenosis, um, focal nodular hyperplasia, which also um, uses decider, largely superseded now by primavist, particularly in adults. Um, and you can, this does come up sometimes in bone marrow imaging. Um, this is, it's a bit of an old display because we don't do it so much anymore, but just to show you what we're looking for. Um, so you, you'll do planar and spec CT, and spec CT images in these um, patients. And then if you've got the, um, the anatomical imaging to confirm with, um, that's really useful. Um, so here there's an area of focally increased uptake. But we'll take you to the um, next slide where it's nice and big. You can see that there's an area which is retaining the tracer um, in the posterior aspect of the right lobe. And then when we look at the lesion that we were investigating on diagnostic CT, um, we can see that it's accumulating the um, the hydra or the decide, or sorry the the sulfur colloid. Um, it's hanging on to it while the rest of the liver is washing out. And this is kind of quite similar to what you'd expect with primavist. Um, and this was diagnostic of an FNH, um, normal liver tissue, but just delayed washout just because of the disorganisation of the hepatocytes within the lesion. Um, for splenosis, we can use damaged red cells um, and um, which will kind of accumulate traces similar to normal spleen as it would with the reticular endothelial system. Um, but hemangiomas are also useful as well as they will have persistent tracer uptake. Um, so you can see here, there was a question about whether this could be a splenunculus or some other lesion in the pancreatic tail demonstrated um, uptake of the damaged red cells similar to the adjacent spleen and therefore diagnostic of a splenunculus. There it is there. And there. This is quite a wild case. Um, and it's really quite one of the novel uses of damaged red cells. Um, this patient had a splenectomy post motor vehicle accident um, and ended up with multiple lesions throughout the pleural cavity, query splenosis. Um, so they were underwent a damaged red cell study. Um, you can see that there's multiple areas of amorphous in intensely increased tracer accumulation throughout the left hemithorax. Um, and then when you correlate with spec CT, the lesions um, that were seen on CT, both inside and outside of the thorax and, and some plurally based, um, demonstrated intense accumulation of those damaged red cells um, concordant with a diagnosis of splenosis secondary to previous splenectomy and thoracic, penetrating thoracic trauma. Quite interesting. Um, this is just what hemangiomas look like. So you know, um, so less so on the immediate statics, but then on the two hour statics, when there's washout of the normal liver, um, you see that there's trapping in several um, lesions within the liver. And then when we correlate with our spec CT, we see that there's focally increased uptake corresponding to several lesions within the liver, which were the, the which were the lesions of interest and then therefore confirmed as hemangiomas on this study. Um, sentinel node biopsies, um, sentinel node studies um, in lymphatic mapping, um, we use technetium and timony sulfur colloid, another particle. 
Um, so ideally what we're trying to do is localize um, the closest draining lymph node for breast skin cancers, um, including the, especially melanoma and occasionally um, other um, SCCs of the oropharynx or vulval um, to try and help the surgeons um, anticipate where the closest draining lymph node is and give it, get a better patient outcome because we're doing a more accurate sentinel node. Um, with breast imaging, um, it's just useful with the gamma probe as well. Most commonly it's going to go to the axilla, but it's useful to know whether there's um, variant drainage of the breast, including to internal mammary lymph nodes, or alternatively a wildly variant um, drainage in patients who have had previous axillary dissection and or, and or radiotherapy and have um, come in for a second, reach, um, a second cancer or alternatively a local recurrence. Um, so by localizing the drain, increase the closest drainage nose, taking it out, sectioning it up, it impacts on how they go forward with their treatment. Um, we use um, an early imaging technique, so we inject, image at 30 minutes, and then also do a spec CT um, to help the surgeons as well, as well as marking on the skin in um, anterior and oblique projections if we're possible. This is a pretty normal study. So this was a lesion in the left lateral breast. Um, you can see the standing anterior um, transmission, LAO and lateral images demonstrating um, increased tracer accumulation in an ipsilateral left axillary lymph node, which was then confirmed on spec CT. And I went and we marked that on the skin and she had her sentinel bone biopsy successfully. Um, this is another case. Unfortunately, I don't have a spec CT for this one, but you can see that rather than going to the arm, um, to the axilla, this lead, um, the closest draining lymph node here was medially, which was localized to an internal mammary lymph node. Um, this is quite a, a really interesting case um, that we had last week. Um, this patient had already had an axillary dissection for an ipsilateral um, cancer as well as radiotherapy. And initial drainage um, didn't demonstrate any movement of the tracer. So we did a further delayed phase imaging following further massage to try and get the lymphatics working. And you can see a trail going across into the other breast. So this is the contralateral axilla. So occasionally they'll stop at an internal mammary lymph node and then keep going. And very, very, very rarely they'll go, um, there'll be um, an aberrant drainage to the contralateral side. So indeed her sentinel node for her right breast cancer was a left level one axillary lymph node. Really uncommon, but um, very interesting. Okay, so um, we're at 7.30, so we'll go through positron emitters. Um, hopefully this will be a bit of a quick one because a lot of the anatomy and the way that we approach oncology imaging will be transferable to how you present a PET case should you get it in the viva. Um, just for a bit of revision, positrons are antimatter, they're the opposite of electrons. They'll meet an electron and then they'll um, annihilate, send two photons at 511 keV, 180 degrees to each other. And that's why we can use a dedicated PET scanner. And you'll notice that it has much better spatial resolution to our spec cameras that you see with things like bone scans and the modalities that we've gone through previously. So the patient will be in our tunnel, ring our detectors and we'll get a nice image when it's paired with a CT. So there's a lot of PET traces and pharmaceuticals. So not all that we do with PET is F18, FDG. Um, F to, but we will start there because that's the most common one. So that's looking at metabolic activity. It's a very sensitive study, but it's not a very specific study. And that's because tumors and infection and inflammation both have increased metabolic activity, as well as some other feet findings as well. Um, other examples of, tracer, of PET traces which utilize F18 include um, FET, which is an amino acid and very useful in brain imaging. Um, Florbetaben, that's a new tracer which is used um, for Alzheimer's disease for modeling beta amyloid plaques. Um, some places use um, F18 PSMA, including a lot of private practices. Um, and when there was a technician shortage earlier this year, earlier last year, sorry, um, there was a move to using um, sodium fluoride um, bone um, agents for bones imaging, especially in paediatric patients. Gallium 68 um, can be paired to PSMA for looking for prostate specific membrane antigen for our well differentiated prostate cancer patients. And gallium 68 dotatate um, is very useful for anything that expresses somatostatin and that includes neuroendocrine tumors. Oh gosh, that's horrible. 
68 FFDG. So um, 18 FDG um, is a glucose analog. It's trapped in the cells due to an altered um, metabolic pathway to glucose, but it is a very good analog for, for mapping the, um, the process. When we describe it, we talk about avidity, um, but multiple things can have, have um, associated um, glucose metabolism, including physiological processes, infection, inflammation, and high grade, and um, neoplasm, neoplasms, especially high grade. Um, keep in mind that not all neoplastic lesions are gonna be glucose avid, particularly ones that are well differentiated, as well as some clear cell and mucinous neoplasms as well, regardless of grade. Also remember that not all neoplastic lesions are large enough to see. So some may be too small, um, as not enough counts get into the detector or breathing motion artifact is spreading them out. Um, so keep in mind that anything below 10 millimetres is difficult to characterise. You might encounter, encounter some different colour scales. Um, this is pet rainbow, this is cool, this is hot, and this is the um, your regular inverse grey scale. So the ones that you'll all, in most um, pet cases, you'll see an inverse grayscale. Um, so anything black is going to be um, increased um, uptake. This was a sarcoma case. Um, my current site uses rainbow. My former site uses cool. I like cool, but um, that's just my preference. And um, you can use um, hot to troubleshoot as well. Um, whereas initially when pet came to Australia, a lot of sites were using hot. This is a case of um, lung cancer. There's a very large um, FDG avid mass in the left hilum with ipsilateral um, mediastinal nodes um, as well. And you can see this on the MIP. This is what we call the MIP projection and it gives you a really nice overview of what you're looking at. So there's that large cancer that we see here as well as lymph nodes um, and then abnormal uptake in the um, liver, which you can see, oh, sorry, skip too quickly. See here with an area of um, decreased tracer accumulation centrally likely reflecting necrosis. And then these lesions down here as well, reflecting bone metastases. So the MIP's useful to give you a good overview. If I was presenting a PET um, case in a viva, just keep it simple, tumour, nodes, metastases, other, and that goes for any oncology case that you happen to present. It gives your um, presentation a really um, good flow, it acts as a checklist for you going through things, and it also shows your examiner that you know your way around oncology imaging and you're comfortable within the, um, the subspecialty. Um, here's a head and neck case, asymmetrical tonsillar uptake is the finding here, and this was a primary neoplasm of the left palatine tonsil. You can see there's some soft tissue thickening and intense FDG avidity on the corresponding fused PET exam. And then as we go through from tumour to nodes to metastases, we see that there's ipsilateral enlarged hypermetabolic um, level 2 lymphadenopathy, which then extends down into the inferior, um, more inferior cervical chain, as we can see on the coronal imaging as well. Um, you then um, review the remainder of the film, particularly looking at the rotating map to see if there was evidence of distant metastatic disease, particularly paying attention to the lungs in cases of head and neck cancer. Um, this is just a good example of lymphoma. So you've got um, increased, um, you've got lymphadenopathy above the diaphragm involving the mediastinum, supraclavicular and axillary stations. And then you can see on the post, um, post or the mid cycle chemo image that a lot of that has resolved. There's probably a little bit of residual uptake. However, it's below liver background, which demonstrates that we're probably looking at a complete metabolic response. Although in practice, you'd go through those nodes one by one. Keep in mind that not all that is FDG avid is cancer. Um, this is quite an amazing case. Um, it looks like he's got widespread skeletal metastatic disease. However, once we looked closer, and I think he was actually biopsied, and it was initially thought that this patient might have had cancer because he had very, very widespread um, bone lesions. But then when we look at the lungs, we see um, bilateral hyalur uptake. And we also see this pattern of nodularity in the lungs, and all of these were FDG avid. Um, when you went through it um, in a case setting, it looked like the, no, the nodules followed a perilymphatic distribution with some um, subpleural nodules as well. And the biopsy of these um, skeletal lesions confirmed that this was a granulomatous process and this patient was diagnosed with sarcoidosis.
Moving on to dotate, um, so it's essentially modeling somatostatin receptor expression. It's very useful for neuroendocrine tumors, particularly of the gastrointestinal tract, um, pancreas and, bronch and um, bronchial carcinoids. Um, other lesions it's useful for include the pheochromocytomas, meningiomas, paragangliomas, and medullary thyroid cancer. As we discussed earlier, it can form a theranostic care with lutetium-77 dotate to give targeted therapy, which is called theranostics. Um, keep in mind that well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors have greater intensity on gallium-68 dotate, and as they become more poorly differentiated, they become more FDG avid and less somatostatin receptor expressing. So as they lose like their normal cellular structure. Um, this is what a physiological, what physiological uptake looks like. It's normal to see the pituitary, salivary glands, thyroid, liver, spleen, adrenal glands, kidneys, bladder, and a little bit in bowel. Um, so you, by understanding the physiological uptake, um, it will help you better identify pathology. Um, here's an example of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. I think I put an arrow on here. I um, see there's focal intense uptake in the tail or body to tail of the pancreas. So this is not physiological uptake and this is in keeping with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Presenting this case, you go and look for peripancreatic nodes and liver lesions, but none were present in this case. Here's another example. There's a very large um, dotate, um, the very large lesion um, with intense dotate uptake in the right um, right upper cervical or right upper neck, um, which was in keeping with a paraganglioma in this case. Um, Paraganglium is less likely to be metastas metastatic, but if you are looking at um, a syndrome, a syndrome patient, um, it's useful to look for to see if there's a multifocal paraganglioma if you were presented with a case like this. PSMA um, is for the prostate, prostate cancer patients. Um, it's essentially modeling um, di different, um, differentiated prostate cancer. This is quite a marked case of widespread um, prostate cancer skeletal metastases, all demonstrating intense increased PSMA avidity. Um, there is a lot of work um, in developing theranostics in this, in this area, and there is, um, you can treat with lutetium PSMA, another theranostic PET. Um, but it is essentially a very specific tracer, although you can get a little bit of mild uptake in inflammation. Oh, similar to um, dotate, um, the more poorly differentiated the prostate cancer is, the less PSMA expressing and more FDG expressing it can be as well. Um, so this is a case of um, what a primary tumor can look like, the prostate still in situ. It's important to separate it from normal physiological bladder activity and it can be quite close by, but here there would be a lesion in the right lobe of the prostate and then on, there it is there, and then on the next picture, you'd correlate with it extending into the adjacent seminal vesicles. Similar, so if you do see something like this, just approach it as you would a prostate MRI, look at where the primary tumor is, look at where it extends to, have a think about where it is locally, and then assess for local nodes in the pelvis and then metastases. So tumor, nodes, metastases, and use your knowledge of how prostate cancer behaves on MRI to correlate it with this, um, this particular investigation. Okay, um, and lastly, there's some more bone metastases in this case. You can see that there's, you could use those words like throughout and widespread. Um, there is widespread um, multifocal heterogeneous increased PSMA of uptake throughout the skeleton, particularly within the spine with a large lesion in the lumbar spine. Um, and then kind of go through and describe. Um, there's no nodes or no uptake in the prostate bed. Um, this would be most in keeping with widespread skeletal metastases in a patient with prostate cancer. Yeah. Something like that. Wow, that is the longest lecture I have ever given or ever delivered. I'm so sorry if it went too quickly or broke your brains. Um, do you want to take off mute? Is there any questions or comments or things that we should potentially revisit in further lectures or further sessions? That was really great. Thanks, Sally. <laughs> no worries. I'm sorry if I've given you, if I've overloaded you with too much information. It really was a bit of a crash course, wasn't it? Um, I'll just open up the chat. Oh, thanks, Sal. <laughs> new, new commit on speed. It's great. Uh, 
Thanks, Sally. Hopefully it was a good, um, it was, if you've got a, had a little bit of like knowledge, hopefully it kind of just gave you a bit of an exposure to all of the different cases, like all of the things that you could get. Um, so what we'll do, I think we're dividing back into the Viva groups um, the next time we do some training. And hopefully we'll have some tools for um, how to interpret them. So when we do go to have a look at the cases, it's not the first time you've seen it, if that makes sense. Um, oh, okay, so I've got a question from Gary. Um, if an abnormality is less hot on gallium scan compared to bone scan. Oh, great. So you're talking about gallium 67. Um, that's a really good question. So it's more, if it's less hot on the gallium scan, it's more likely to be a different pathology rather than infection. Um, things that could be um, stress fractures um, or some inflammatory process, like an inflammatory, like an arthritis, if it's degenerative, for example. A really good example, if you've got a really hot shoulder and you don't know whether it's, um, if it's going to be severe osteoarthritis or severe degenerative change. So then you do the gallium scan and it's not as avid um, or not as intense, then you can kind of be more confident. Whereas if it's more hot and more extensive on the gallium 67 scan, then you're more consistent, you're more concerned that that's a septic joint. Um, another example would be a Charcot foot as well, because sometimes in our diabetic patients, the MRI can be confusing too. So um, white cell scan or gallium scan can be useful in trying to determine whether there's osteomyelitis complicating a diabetic foot. Cool. Um, any other questions? Just a quick one. Yeah. Why do we keep using MIBG in neuroblastomas? Why don't we just use Dogetay? Um yeah, it's um, it's kind of, I think, the availability of the literature. I think with MIBG, especially for the kids, we've got so much experience with it um, and it's shown to be quite a really, it's been a really good tracer. Um, and I think it's kind of, I, I would, it wouldn't surprise me as in the, ne in the next few years, we start to move forward to kind of to more towards Dota Tate. The thing with um, the treatment, which is the, the lutate, it's not so well studied in kids. Um, however, there is a lot of research coming out now with its utility in neuroendocrine, um, within treatment of the neuroendocrine tumors, a lot more safety data, a lot more dosimetry data in terms of long-term effects and the, the way that it's kind of distributed with the kids. Um, so I think it's a bit of a watch this space. Um, and I think as the evidence grows and the safety data grows and the dosimetry and radiation safety grows, we might very well see to start to see that change. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, no worries. Um, anything else? Anything else I can help with at the moment? Really quickly, just from an exam perspective, mm -hmm. um, can you comment on uh, contrast enhanced CT uh, in, of the neck uh, for um, thyroid staging and whether it affects whether you can do a neck med study later on? Ah, okay. Yep. So contrast. Um. So iodinated contrast hangs around for about four weeks. So ideally, you wouldn't want to be doing a thyroid um protectinate study, um, for within four weeks of that. Um, and also for treatment. So for radioiodine um administration, you don't want to be giving radioactive iodine therapy within four weeks of an iodinated contrast study. Um, for thyroid cancer, I think um. You wouldn't so much be doing a protectinate, like a thyroid protectinate study for that anyway. So really in the cancer perspective, it's kind of more about radioiodine, which is probably what you were getting at, Vinay. Apologies. Um, does, that, does that answer your question or? Yep, thanks. Fantastic, yeah, about four weeks. Um, if you've got any extra questions, um, my email is up on the screen. I'm very, very happy to be contacted. Um, otherwise, a few of you have got my mobile as well. Um, if anyone's, um, if what we'll what we'll try and do is we'll try and kind of keep high yield for um, for the case sessions. We'll do a bit of we'll do a bit of bone scan. We'll do a bit of kind of the common things that have popped up. Um, just focus a lot on technique and just kind of ideally with a nuclear medicine case, you want to identify it, kind of present it quickly and get it down. I think you don't want to be tying yourself in knots, um, and I think that's probably going to be the the best way to kind of encounter it. Keep it simple. Don't overthink it and get the case down nice and quick. Probably goes for most things though. Um, beautiful, all right, if, if there's no more questions, I'm probably happy to wrap it up there, if you guys are happy to as well. Oh, lots of thank yous. Um, it's really, this is the first time I've done a Zoom lecture like this, so hopefully it's been okay.
Um, I know that it's, it's much nicer to deliver teaching in person, but um, hopefully we'll be able to get back to that soon. All right, so all the best. Thank you again. And um, I'll see, talk to you guys all in a few weeks.